been developing these systems to collect rainwater from his roofs, to store that rainwater and then use it in the gardens. With these continuing droughts, we so look forward to your presentation, Ray, on how we can incorporate some of your ideas and save valuable rainwater in our own yards. Welcome. Thank you. Am I good to go now then? I guess I am, huh? You, you are. are good to go. Yeah. Great. And just a note uh, that I, we are recording this uh, yep. presentation. So if you are on video, you will be recorded. But Ray has asked that people turn their video on if they're able to so that he can have an audience. Yeah, I like I like to see my students' faces, although I feel awkward saying that you guys are my students. Um, yeah. Uh, so uh, amongst my colleagues and I, we, we believe that you got to teach a course about three times before you really figure it out. And uh, this is the first time I'm presenting that. So that's a little disclaimer. Also, yeah, I know a ton about structural engineering. I teach structural engineering all the time. I don't know much about rainwater harvesting. So I think you've all been, been, <laughs> been sold some sort of a line here. So I don't, you know, don't expect me to be perfect at this presentation or know what I'm talking about, which is exactly where I need to be as a professor, I guess. If you have any comments, you can throw them into chat and I don't mind um, uh, answering questions along the way as well. So you could put your questions in the chat and then We'll take them. Hey, Carol, you can you can let me know when we get a question as it comes, and then we'll do questions at the end. We'll do. So, all right. Um, well, I uh, I have a colleague who is an expert uh, in uh, water resources, and uh, she directed me to a couple of things and uh, collected some data here. Now, this comes uh, from NOAA, and um, you can see. Uh, Essex County, Massachusetts here. And uh, this is last year or a one year of precipitation up to now. And you can see that in Essex County, we're at 38 inches and that's on the low side. In fact, that's, uh, that's four inches lower than it should be for a 12 month period. And that's probably not surprising you. Um, and that, that's why it's, we're in a rank, this is the 30th uh, driest uh, 12 month period of this sort. Uh, the average rainfall for uh, this uh, basically 100 year period would be 43 inches of rainfall a year. So yeah, it's been a bit dry. Um, and then uh, I was able to uh, pull this together and this is over the last basically 100 years of data and uh, you can see that August is uh, typically our driest month. And if you've been living here very long, you probably already know that. Um, I was a little surprised to see that July was a little higher than June, but there you go. And that May seems to be a bit low. Uh, of course, this there's there are anomalies in the data, but uh, that's basically where where we stand. So uh, rainfall harvesting is all about bridging a dry period. Uh, collecting water when we have plenty and then um, and then using it when we need it. Um, yeah, there are a lot of benefits to it. I started messing around with my system quite a while ago and it's it's become kind of elaborate as I make mistakes and figure things out as I go along. Um, and of course, climate change uh, is a thing. And um, if we take a look at where we're headed, we're actually headed towards more rain in our area with climate change uh, than we have uh, experienced in the past. Um, but it's not, it's not just about rain, it's about storm frequency, magnitude, intensity, et cetera. I'll, I'll come back to that. Um, and then the other thing about climate change, I, I show my students this. Um, if, if the greener it is, the better it is for us human folks. Um, we can take a look at how that's going to change um, in, with climate change. And you can see that, that kind of like North Carolina's climate is sort of moving towards us in Massachusetts with climate change. I can talk more about climate change. Um, 
you know, it's, it's a subject that uh, a lot of us get pretty passionate about. And uh, I'm glad to say that a lot of my students coming into, into the university are also passionate about it. Um, if we take a look at, at how things are changing in the seasons, though, it's not the same story. Um, and you can see that we're expecting to have um, wetter spring and fall and winter, but uh, summers are going to stay the same or even get a bit drier in our area. Um, that's what the models indicate. And then this is the one that's very concerning, and that's the the the. So with climate change, we can expect our normal weather patterns to change and become more erratic. And although we're going to have a larger annual precipitation, the maximum precipitation for an event is going to increase, which means we're gonna to get too much water sometimes in a rainstorm, more than we've seen. So we'll be breaking records that way. And we're also on the other side of the scale, we're likely to have longer periods of dry weather, which uh, we've experienced uh, just uh, last summer, for example. So yeah, it's all a bit concerning. If I take a look at precipitation by date in Newburyport over the last 100 years, roughly, you can kind of see how the swings get wilder, uh, particularly in the last decade. Now, you know, this is just one station and uh, it's over a hundred years. I think if you squint your eyes, you can kind of see the trend towards more precipitation per year. Um, and then you can see these just gigantic swings recently. So there you go. So rainwater harvesting, um, it's, it's basically collecting water probably off your roof and uh, storing it up and then being able to use it on your gardens. And uh, that's good. You know, I didn't even put any slides in here. I could have about, uh, you know, our water availability in West Newbury. I'm sure you know that, uh, I forget what it's about half, maybe Ann would know, Ann Madden. I don't know about, I think about half of our households are on uh, town water. I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, I'm not sure. But in any case, um, Oh, and gosh, now I'm going completely off script. I forget when it was, 200 years ago or something, some well-intentioned official of West Newbury sold our surface water, drinking water rights to Newburyport for a dollar. And uh, we've been trying to fix that ever since. And uh, uh, legally we can't. So we have to buy water back from Newburyport from time to time. And so anything that we can do to, uh, to minimize the impact on the town water supply is good. And then even if you have a well, um, you know, um, there are times if we have a significant dry spell, um, you can draw down the groundwater and depending on who's, who your neighbors are and where you are in town and all that kind of stuff. I mean, it's possible that, that your well can run low um, or your well might be fine, but you, you accidentally run your neighbor's well down low. So we, we do want to conserve water. Um, I like this picture. There's a lot of things to like about this picture. And then there's some things that are a little silly. That's a very small barrel, um, but it is elevated. We're going to talk about that. Um, and you can see that this is a very simple system and it's just uh, driven by gravity. And that works fine. Um, you, you, if you attach a hose to this system, you're not going to get very much flow through the hose, and um, because you know water does want to flow downhill, and there's differential head and resistance in the in the hose and whatnot. It take a very long time to. Uh, so anyway, the first, the easiest system that we're going to talk about is gravity systems. But you might be interested to know that rain barrels are not legal in all states. Um, and this, this can really get people upset. But the idea is that uh, if you're collecting your rainwater, you're preventing that water from going downstream or into the ground as it did before you started collecting it. Um, and so there's something called prior, appropri uh, prior appropriation. 
And in some states, if you're the first person to use water productively, then you have that right forever, basically. Um, and you know that wasn't a problem when water was plentiful, but now out west, well, for a long time now, but um, this is the cause of much consternation and states are fighting with states and there are agreements between the United States and Mexico. And, uh, you know, Nevada is even having a huge fight within the state of Nevada between the northern part and the southern part. You got Las Vegas, you've got the, the big reservoirs and dams. It's just a huge issue. But prior appropriation in some states means that rain barrels are not allowed or they're ex uh, very restricted. And Colorado is one of those. Um, they did change the law in Colorado. And if you meet all, there's a, there's a long list of criteria, but you can basically have two uh, rain barrels at your house, whereas before you couldn't have any. But even so, this isn't for everybody. If we take a look at state by state, you can see how the, the southwestern states, um, it, there are restrictions. And, and this is a very simplified map. Some of the restrictions are, are really strong. And then in other states, it's encouraged. And, and we could go into all kinds of things here. For example, uh, foreign governments buying land in the United States um, in states such as Texas, where you can pump as much groundwater as you want uh, without getting permission from anybody. And then you can grow those crops and then export the crops and you're essentially exporting water to uh, foreign countries. So there's all kinds of interesting things that we could talk about here. But, 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 let's get back to uh, West New Britain. So let's start where it all starts and that's precipitation. And uh, I, uh, I ran all this stuff through a spreadsheet today uh, to get a histogram of rainfall events in Newburyport. There are thousands and thousands of them. Uh, I think the, uh, the lines in my spreadsheet went over, over 36,000. Um, and a lot of those lines, um, you know, the precipitation events are, are null. The lines were there for other climate data. But you can see how, um, this is not a histogram. This is not a bell curve. People often think that rainfall it forms into a normal distribution. Well, this is decidedly not a normal distribution. There is no average rainfall uh, that makes much sense, really. Uh, if you put these in bins of a quarter inch, so anything from a rainfall of, of a trace amount up to a quarter inch is in that first bin, and you can see that there's over 7,000 events uh, that showed up there. If we go to the next bin, which would be 0.25 to 0.5 inches, you can see how it drops to 2,000. And in fact, that's a, that's a beautiful curve, really, um, asymptotically approaching the x-axis at zero. Um, um, but it's, it's a, you know, just sort of as a rule of thumb, something to put in your back pocket, uh, an average decent rain around here would be only about an eighth of an inch of rain. Um, and people don't realize that one inch of rain is a very significant event. Um, the largest uh, rainfall event that we had in Newburyport was in 1996. I was living in the area, I don't remember this, but in October, over a period of uh, basically a day and a half, we picked up over 13 inches in one event. 13 inches of rain is an incredible amount, and it's going to flood all kinds of streets and underpasses and whatnot. Um, so I just threw that up there because it's kind of fun. Now, if you're interested in finding out uh, how much you would get in a rainstorm, uh, it's just a, it's a fairly basic equation. You take the horizontal collection area and you multiply it times the inches of rainfall collected. Um, if you could, you would subtract out losses. Figuring out how much losses are is complicated. I can't do it. I can just kind of give you a sort of a hunchy answer. Um, but when, when it's been dry and it first starts raining, some of the rain will evaporate right off the roof. Some will splatter off the roof. Uh, some needs to get into the crevices and pore structure of the roofing material. 
Some of it's lost uh, as it goes into the gutter and then in the downspout. But those losses are not that significant and they become uh, smaller and smaller as the uh, size of the rainfall event increases. Now there's something called dimensional analysis that our chemistry students struggle through and it's making all the units work. But basically, if you're collecting a uh, thousand square feet of area, which would be, yeah, to, it's a, reasonably, a reasonable sized roof. I, uh, Deb Hamilton would know how many square feet the average house is in, in West Newbury, but I'm thinking it's probably over 2,000 at this point, comfortably over, I would guess, for new construction. But there are a lot of older houses in West Newbury that, that uh, would be smaller. And then, it, of course, it depends on whether it's one story, two story, and all that kind of stuff. But 1,000 square feet for uh, projected horizontal area, the footprint of your house is reasonable. And then if we take that time, a, a good rainfall at a quarter inch, you can see that you collect about 150 gallons. So if you want to memorize a number, that's it. Quarter inch of rain, thousand square feet, about 150 gallons. Now, if you want to figure out uh, your collection area, there's a cool thing. I'm going to stop this share. And then I'm going to see if I can work Zoom. Oh, we do we have something? Do we have a question? Okay, there we go. Deb said it's about half an hour. Okay, there you go. All right. Uh, now I'm gonna I'm gonna share screen with um, Google Earth. Now Google Earth is a little bit different than Google Maps. It used to be that you had to download a program and everything, and it was a big deal. But now you can just go out on the interwebs and search for Google Earth and uh, fire it up. And I did this, and if I, I'm gonna come in here and I'm gonna see if I can zoom in on the library to give an example here. Am I, whoop, am I off? I often get off. Now I gotta zoom out again to see where the heck I am. There's Mill Pond, okay, there we go. Um, yeah, here we go, here's the library. So let's say uh, I was gonna, figure out uh, the, rain, the the square footage that I was gonna collect off the roof and, the, and I'll just use the library. There's a little tiny ruler thing off to the left. Um, and Annie, can, can, can you nod if you can see my little hand? Can you see my cursor? Yeah, okay, good. All right, so um, you can click on this little ruler here and then you can start like let's say I was going to have a gutter and I was going to pick up everything that was going to fall in the courtyard so I'm going along the ridge line here right and uh, I'm just kind of clicking as I go I'm not being super accurate but there's really no reason to be and then when I close the shape that would be the roof area that I might collect for, for uh, my rainfall collections. I mean, it'd be great if I collect the whole roof, but this is just an example. And if you come over here, you can see that that's about 2000 square feet. So for this, if we had a quarter inch rainfall and we were collecting this much off the library roof, we'd get 300 gallons. 300 gallons is a lot. That, you know, that's, a, that, that's a good deal. All right, I'm gonna stop this year and I'm gonna jump back to my presentation. Okie dokie. Now, another question that might come up would be, uh, what sort of size do you need? And that really depends on what you wanna do uh, with, with your rain. Um, every, the typical rain barrel that you might get would be about 50 gallons. For some reason, it's because people have reused barrels for, uh, as rain barrels. So a 50 gallon barrel or 55 gallon barrel, that's a pretty standard size. It's not a lot of water. Now, if you're just water hanging plants, then uh, it's going to be just fine and it'll get you through a dry spell, I promise you. Uh, you might be using a gallon or two uh, for, for your watering. And so you can, you, can make, you can stretch that and make it through quite a dry spell. But if you're using a hose and you're watering a vegetable garden, or if you're, uh, you know, if for some reason it, you've decided that there's a, a certain part of your lawn that, that you really need to keep watering or something, you're establishing something, whatever. If you're watering from a hose, 
and you're using a pump system for your rain barrel, it's only going to last about 10 to 25 minutes, depending on how wide you open up your, uh, your hose tool. So uh, I, I, that's why I kind of roll my eyes about Colorado, where they're allowed to have two 50-gallon drums. I mean, it's good. I mean, it's certainly better than not doing it. Um, but it's not going to get you through a long dry spell if you're trying to keep a, a large vegetable garden with it. So, uh, so yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Now, if we if we talk about gravity systems, um, gravity systems are basically the simplest thing that you can do, and you just basically divert the water from a downspout and you put it into a barrel. And then when you want to use the water from the barrel, uh, you attach a hose or you get your, your watering bucket under there and you open a valve. Now, these sorts of rain barrels on the left, I, I find that there's a lot of them for sale out there. And they kind of crack me up because they've got the faucet, you know, a third of the way up the rain barrel. So you can't use all the water. Now, if you buy one that does have a drain, there's a very good chance you could go to Lowe's or Home Depot or the local hardware store. I like the I like I like the one in New Report, the Ace Hardware there. Anyway, you you could you could get a fitting there so that you could attach your hose at the bottom of the rain barrel. And you can see this one on the left is is pretty, and they've got it on a nice stand that's pretty. And there's nothing wrong with being pretty, God knows, but you you don't have to be just a just a recycled drum of some sort uh, sitting on some cinder blocks will, will do the trick. Um, uh, Massachusetts has a nice uh, website and you can, you can just Google Massachusetts rain barrels and this will pop up. And uh, there's, there's lots of uh, good information there. And uh, including some ideas about where you can buy a rain barrel or get a rain barrel. And then, you know, you can ask around, like uh, some of my colleagues live up in New Hampshire, say that there's some there's some cider place where you can get uh, cider barrels for cheap and use those for rain barrels. So you can ask around, but it's probably going to cost you between 50 and 100 bucks if you can get a good price. Um, I don't, I, you know, you can spend a tremendous amount of money on a rain barrel trying to get real fancy. Like this one for 200 bucks actually has kind of a flat side. So it sits closer to your house. I will say you don't want anything up against your house. You want air to get back there, or you could run into problems uh, with your siding and whatnot. Um, but yeah, here's, here's a pretty straightforward barrel, right? 70 bucks. Now a typical trash barrel is probably not gonna be stout enough. Uh, water pressure does build up. And then there are specialized um, companies out there that sell water tanks that you can, you can go for. These guys can actually be stacked, but you're looking at a couple hundred bucks for, for some of those. So yeah, I mean, and every once in a while, somebody runs a deal or a town will subsidize or get a bunch of rain barrels and sell them. I think West Newbury had that going for a while. I don't know, I should have asked. I don't know of anything, any program going on right now in West Newbury. Um, but yeah, so there are a lot of options out there for getting rain barrels. Now, it's actually controversial whether or not you should put in something that used to be considered uh, essential, and that was a first flush diverter. And the idea here is that the water that first comes off your roof at the beginning of a storm is too dirty. And so you divert it, and you can, you can make one of these yourself, or you can buy a commercial one. And the idea is that first flush of water doesn't go into your rain barrel. But it's, it's, it's getting to the point now where people are like, no, it's not worth doing it. Um, first of all, that water isn't so bad. And yeah, that first water will have a higher concentration on bird poop than if it's been raining all day. Uh, but the organic material that, and the dust and whatnot that comes in that initial uh, rain is going to be just fine for your gardens. Um, 
Some of the larger material, I mean, the water should be going through a screen to get into your rain barrel anyway. We can talk about that. Most of the diverter systems mean that you have to go out after every rain and empty them out yourself. Um, if you ignore a diverting system, it just, it'll stop working or it actually can clog the whole system up. And uh, yeah, if it's size too big, you're losing water that you could have collected. And if it's size too small, you're not diverting enough water to begin with. So in the end, I wouldn't worry about it. So screening. So what this is, this is, I think, really pretty. And it's fun to walk by a barrel and look through the clear water and see all the way to the bottom. Uh, but, uh, but it's not a good idea because of mosquitoes. So um, you, you need to think about not letting your mosquitoes use your rain barrel for breeding. And uh, that means basically using screening. Um, and so you can read up on that. It's not that hard to have the water come in through a screen. Um, there are different ways to do it, but you have to worry about particularly ornamental rain barrels and other rain barrels where water might collect in the lid or around the perimeter of the lid, because uh, that can be breeding ground for mosquitoes. And um, you know, if you, if you just drill a bunch of holes, that's not gonna keep a mosquito out. Uh, um, and you're trying to keep adult mosquitoes from going in. And then if somehow they get in there, you're trying to keep brand new mosquitoes from coming out. So, so the bottom line is you should think about that, provide some sort of screening. Um, I, I, these things are pretty inexpensive. Uh, you know, you drill a hole, you pop this puppy in, and then that's where your water comes in. Notice that there's two levels of screening here. If you just use window screen, the water might push it into the barrel. So this screen is backed up by hardware cloth. Um, so, but you can, you know, try stuff, see what works. You can also use uh, products like this. They're inexpensive and you can, you can pop them in the rain barrel. And if, if you just throw one into your rain barrel once a month, uh, if any mosquitoes get in there, it'll kill the larvae. And I'm, I don't like pesticides. I don't like lawn treatments or anything like that. I'm always skeptical of it. I always worry about the impact on the animals and the critters and you know even your dogs and stuff going up through your dog paws and whatnot. Um, but this stuff seems to be pretty safe. Um, in fact, uh, the government, the CDC has put this out. Uh, the, the active ingredient is BTI. And uh, it's not toxic to people and it's not toxic to pets or animals or aquatic life, other insects, and it doesn't hurt honeybees. So, uh, so yeah, I think that, that these mosquito donuts or dunks or whatever, I think that that's a good backup system. So I, frankly, I, well, in my system, I, I, I use both. Um, okay, so let's see here. I gotta be careful that I don't go too long. So height matters, um, and uh, I grew up in Illinois, and there were water uh, towers all over the place um, uh, because everything's so flat. Here in New England, uh, there's enough relief that we can uh, we can put a water tank up next to the school and get enough height over the average house that we get the water pressure that we need. But uh, you're not going to get much water pressure out of a rain barrel. I've done the math here. And uh, typically in West Newbury, 50 PSI isn't bad. In fact, I think my pressure is a little higher than that. Um, but you'd need 115 feet. You need to have your rain barrel 115 feet up in the air to get 50 PSI out of the bottom. That's just not going to happen. But any little bit of height just helps the system work. Um, now, this is a fancy uh, uh, rain barrel on a fancy stand. And that stand is ridiculously expensive. Uh, I, you, don't, you don't need to do that. Um, oh yeah, and I also wanna mention about the stand here. Let me go back a couple. That a 50 gallon drum weighs over 400 pounds. So you can't, just, you can't just put it up on an upside down Home Depot bucket and expect that to work when the barrel's full. So you need the, whatever you stand your rain barrel up on has to be pretty substantial or somebody's gonna get hurt. Um, 
So there you go. Yeah, look at these fancy stands. A hundred bucks for a stand. Well, you can get a cinder block for two and a half bucks and uh, put together some cinder blocks and cap it off and you're okay. If you're, if you're good, if you, if you got some shop tools and whatnot, you can make yourself some nice stands. Uh, whether or not to use pressure treated lumber, we can talk. Um, this also shows you putting a couple of rain barrels together. So that's an idea. We'll talk a little bit about that too. Um, when it comes to multiple tanks, you can arrange them horizontally or vertically. If they're horizontal and your tanks are all the same, no problem, put them all at the same height. I don't think this stand looks substantial enough. To me, I don't like it, but I would, I would have at least, you know, an extra set of bunch of legs under here. But anyway, anyway, anyway. And, and there are systems if, again, you can, you can put them vertically too. Now, when you put them vertically, you're creating a pressure system and uh, you got to be careful because there's a higher percentage chance of leakage in these systems. So you got to be a little more careful. You can use multiple tanks and you can add them over the years. Looks like these people are planning on buying another rain barrel in the future. So they made their stand to accommodate four, an extra 400 pounds there. Um, a vertical uh, system does give you extra height. Extra height means more pressure, and that means it'll be easier to uh, use the water as it drains out. So that's good. Uh, notice that if you have them all side by side, you can connect them with a hose, but realize that here you want the tops to line up. Uh, if the tops aren't all at the same height, then you can't build the water up all the way across. So I have three rain barrels behind the barn here and they're all different sizes. And, and that's causes, that causes me a bit of a problem because I need the tops of all these three very different tanks to be at the same level. Now I'm showing you these rain barrels are connected with simple garden hose here. You can do that. Now here all the rain barrels are in the same place. I gotta point out, you could have rain barrels that are far apart, you could have them you don't have to like redo your whole roof drainage or anything. You can put a rain barrel at every corner of your house and then connect it by a garden hose running along the foundation and the water will move back and forth through that hose so that you're using all three rain barrels or four or whatever. So uh, I think that's a good system and that's a way to collect water from more of your roof. You could have a rain barrel every downspout and then connect them with uh, inexpensive garden hose. But once again, you have to have the top at the same height. And now it's more of an engineering trick because now your rain barrels are far away from each other. You might know what that same height is, but here you get to let the water help you out. You just wait until they start filling up. You take off the lids and you look down inside them and you can see if, if, if that water will all level out. So you can kind of see what rain barrels need to come up and which rain barrels need to go down. And you can shove some cinder blocks uh, here and there until you get them all about level, and then they'll work as a, as a gang system. You can go whole hog. If you were doing new construction and you got people out there digging holes in your ground anyway, you might consider, let's say you're adding a structure uh, on the planning board, we're, we're, we're working on uh, having uh, accessory dwelling unit by law, which will bring before the town one of these days. Let's say you're, you're adding a garage or uh, an accessory dwelling unit or something like that. And you got people out there digging holes for foundations anyway. You might consider spending some money and getting an underground tank. Now, of course, if you got an underground tank, you're gonna have to have a pump to pump the water out of it. That's just part of the deal. And these tanks aren't cheap. You can figure that you're gonna probably spend a couple thousand dollars on the tank and maybe another thousand dollars to have it shipped to you. Um, people do use septic tanks, which are locally available. There are a lot of people out there who say that you should not use a septic tank because a septic tank is designed to be full all the time and cisterns spend a lot of time not being full. So there's extra stress on the walls of septic tanks. I'm guessing that that information is out there by people that want to sell cisterns instead of septic tanks. But in any case, you can consider an underground tank and have that as a cistern. But then, and then you're, you're in with both feet. You're spending serious money and you have to have a pumping system. 
Speaking of pumping, there's a bunch of ways you can do it. If you wanna use your hose, you're gonna need a pump. And pumps are inexpensive. Some pump, you can get simple uh, pumps, uh, you know, out there uh, at the local hardware store for not much money, less than a hundred bucks for sure. The only, uh, there, there are a couple of tricks with pumps though. Um, and, you know, I, I'm gonna have to wind, I don't wanna go too long on this, but you know, there's, there's things about priming the pump and there's things about powering the pump. And then if you're powering the pump with extension cords, uh, then there's the size of the wires because pumps can draw a lot of power. And then there's, uh, you know, you don't want to leave extension cords out outside all the time. And, and so there's a whole bunch of stuff. But the bottom line is, if you get a pump, you can hook it in your rain barrel, and then you can use a hose. Um, and there, you know, there are pumps that, uh, there are pump systems that are designed for rain barrels, uh, where you can throw something down into the rain barrel to kind of suck the water off the bottom. Um, again, priming is something that, you know, you need a self-priming pump for this. Uh, it, you can spend as little or as much money on this kind of thing as you want. But a couple of warnings. You don't want your pump to run dry. So, uh, so when the water uh, runs out, you want the pump to turn off. Now, if, if, you're, if you're there at the end of the hose, what, I think you could try one of these remote control switches that are like 20 bucks. And then you could just put your pump into this and plug this into the wall and then have the remote with you. And you could turn the pump on and off as you use the hose. I think that would work great. Now, having not thought of that a long time, I, I went and got a pressure switch. Now, pressure switches are pretty cool. If, if you're running the hose and you shut off the nozzle, the pressure switch will detect that there's pressure building up in the hose and it'll turn off the pump. These are a trick and a half to get working properly. Now, somebody who does this sort of stuff, a plumber, for example, if you, had a, if you had wanted to hire a plumber to set this system up for you, I'm sure they'd hook it up in no time. Uh, I, for, if you could get a plumber. And they're probably going to charge you at least $150 just to come and sneeze on your property. But in any case, uh, you can you can fig I figured it out. You can figure it out. But that so there's two things with pumps. You don't want them to to try to be pumping air. That's not good on the pump. The pump will probably overheat and you could burn it out. And the other thing you don't want to do is try to keep pumping water when you shut off the nozzle because now the pump is trying to force water into the hose and you've shut off the nozzle. So if the pump keeps trying to push it, it, it's not good for the pump either. Now I did see on Harbor Freight as I was preparing this lecture, I did see that you can buy a whole system here and you can see that we've got, uh, we've got what looks like a pretty nice pump. There's a pressure gauge there, pretty nice pump pressure gauge uh, right down here. It's got a pressure switch and it has a, a pressure tank, which I can talk about in a little bit. And that whole system, 180 bucks. I don't know. Harbor Freight's one of those things where you might get a great tool or it might not be a great tool. I don't know, but there are systems out there. But the bottom line is, if you're gonna pump, you don't want it to run dry and you don't want it to try to pump when the hose is closed. And so you've got to figure out a way to deal with that. And uh, some sort of switch is probably in order. Now to uh, finish this up, and then we'll take questions. Uh, people have been asking about my system. And like I said, I've been working on this for a long time. Uh, there's almost always been a building permit open on my house uh, since I added this porch and all this kind of stuff. Um, and one of the things I did is when I when uh, I redid my house is I installed a water collection which gets about a little more than half of the roof off the house and about a third of the roof off the barn. Um, uh, I did what I said I, I was explaining to you guys. I'm collecting about 2,700 square feet. So if I have a, uh, a, a decent rainstorm, I can get about 500 gallons out of a decent rainstorm. 
Um, so that's good. And 500 gallons, uh, that's enough to, to get you through a pretty long dry spell, even if you're using a lot of water on your gardens. 500 gallons is good. 50 gallons probably isn't enough. 500 gallons is good. Since then, though, there's a, I keep getting nervous every time my rain barrels get low. So I added another 500. And then we had this last summer. And I've got, I got another barrel. It's a thousand gallon barrel and uh, it's sitting back there and I got to hook them all up. And uh, it's a big project. I'm thinking about doing a concrete pad and all that kind of stuff. But anyway, there you go. So I collect the water uh, from the gutters and it goes into these buried doodads. Um, and I've got this running uh, around the house and it runs on gravity flow um, to a sump. And uh, this, I just, uh, I just fixed up one part of the system this summer. I took this little video and you can see how the, you know, the water's coming out of the different pipes. So two pipes are coming into this and then one pipe's taking the water out and it's going towards a sump pump um, in, uh, in a deeper, bigger uh, pit later on. Um, and that deeper, bigger pit is down here. And then there's a pump that pumps it up into the rain barrels. You see, there's that brand new tank. And that tank's about eight feet wide, uh, eight feet tall, and about five feet in diameter. And the shipping costs more than the tank did. <laughs> so you got to be a little nuts, I think. Um, but there's a 550 gallon tank, a 500 gallon tank behind it, and then the new one to hook up. And you can see that I've elevated these on structures that I built. Um, but wood doesn't last forever, even pressure treated wood. So I think I'm gonna replace this with cinder block structures. Maybe, maybe try my hand at a little masonry. Um, and then this is, uh, this is my pump system here. And then it goes out here where it, it connects to conventional spigots. And uh, yeah, so that's my system. Uh, this shows you the pump system. I've got a more recent picture to show you in a sec. And uh, yeah, I'm going vertical with my gardens. Now, one of the problems, uh, so the, uh, the rain all goes, whoop, wrong direction. Rain all goes to this little, there's this pit here is about three feet deep and about two feet wide. And down at the bottom, I have a connectional uh, sump pump. And as you know, a sump pump will kick on when the water builds up. So when the rain comes rushing in there, the switch kicks on and it starts pumping water up through this hose into the barrel. But then if they have a long, prolonged rain event and the barrels are full, I don't want to be pumping water in just to have it go through the overflow and out. Then I'm wasting electricity just to move water. So I need to have it cut off somehow. And uh, third generation, I came up with this little gizmo and the overflow fills up this water bottle and there's a hole in the bottom of the water bottle, but it comes in faster than it goes out. The bottle fills up, the weight flips the switch off. So that's what, that's what stops the sump pump. And it's pretty Rube Goldberg, but by God, it's reliable. It works great. <laughs> um, and then if we take a closer look at what's going on at the pump. Now this, I haven't talked about in the winterizing your system and blowing all your tubes out and all that kind of stuff, but so uh, I haven't set this up yet. We're not, uh, you know, I'm, I'm waiting for the last chance of the frost to pass us by, but here's the pump. The water comes in here and then this pump pumps it up here. There's a little uh, um, uh, anti-water hammer uh, bit there. Um, this is my pressure switch, which I, you know, it took me a long time to figure out. There's two different springs in there and it's a little scary in there, these electrical contents and there's little, sparks and whatnot is work, but I got that sucker working. And I've got pressure gauges before and after this valve, and I can close this valve and open these valves, and then the water is diverted through a filter system. And by having pressure gauges on both sides, I can see if the filters are, are in good shape or if they need to be replaced. If the, if the, if the filters become clogged, then there's a significant pressure drop across the, uh, the filter loop. Um, and then in order to get the pressure switch to work properly, you need to have a pressure tank. This pressure tank is filled with a lot of air. And when, the, when 
you shut the hose, the pressure builds up in the system and it compresses the air. And then when you open the hose, the air pushes back on the water. And what this does is it reduces the cycling on the pump. So it's a long story and you can see how it starts getting a little complicated to make the system work, but, but that's basically how it works. So yeah, and then uh, this summer I started uh, doing uh, drip irrigation. And uh, so because I've got my pressure system working now, I can have drip irrigation and I've got valves and I can turn on different sections and, and water that way. So that's my system. And uh, I'm also growing, trying my hand. This is the first golden retriever I was able to grow from seed. And uh, <laughs> that dog's worked out pretty well. I may try to grow a couple more golden retrievers in the garden this, this coming <laughs> summer. We'll see how that works. They're sort of a pain to harvest, but uh, yeah. So I'll be glad to take any questions anybody's got. Well, Annie had a frog that loved to hang in her rain barrel. What's she that now? She would, she, Annie had a frog that would hang in her rain barrel. Oh. And she said she would move him out and he would just come back any, every day. Wow. Is there any problem with having a frog in your rain barrel? The only problem I can see with a frog in the rain barrel, I wouldn't worry about uh, uh, a frog excrement. I would think that's probably a good thing to have in your rainwater. Uh, but then there, again, there's the concern about uh, mosquitoes. So I'd say that if you had a frog in your rain barrel and you wanted to keep your frog in your rain barrel, I would say that you'd have to go with those mosquito uh, dunks and uh, it shouldn't hurt the frog. Um, and, uh, and that way you could, you could have your resident rain barrel frog. So that's, and then I think you need to name them. Oh yeah. So what somebody about? asked if your system would support a chihuahua. <laughs> yes. In fact, uh, I know my system supports one 92 pound golden retriever. So I'm guessing that's about eight chihuahuas. <laughs> yeah. Here's something from Beth. Can you explain the need for a filter system? Oh, uh, you don't need a filter system. Uh, I have a filter system uh, because um, uh, if I want to use the water for something else, I have the filter system built in. Okay. Um, and the only place that, that you do need a filter for sure is if you do go to drip irrigation, you have to make sure that uh, <laughs> you minimize the particulates going into your system or they can start clogging up the little nozzles and you won't get the flow that you need. Uh, but, um, you know, I drip irrigation would be a whole nother lecture and, uh, I'm just figuring it out myself. So thank you. What else can I, what else can I talk about? This the, the favorite part of being a professor is answering questions. So if you're not asking questions, then I'm not earning my pay. What Carol, what am I getting for this? Oh, uh, we, we still have to talk. Okay. All right. All right. Eternal gratitude. Okay. Right. Etern I like that. that yeah, was good. That's good. That's good. I, I, I'll work for that. I work for less. I, I could always uh, come and show you the birds around your yard. What's that now? I said I could always come and show you the birds around oh, your see, yard. There you go. Yeah, yeah. I've always loved birds. So, what if uh, you have a shed? and you would like to collect water around the shed, but there's no gutter system on the shed. So uh, basically, all right, now we're starting to get into building design and the value of gutters. Um, there's so much that is better for you. If you have, uh, in this slide, you can see that I added rake overhangs to my house, there weren't any. Uh, so there's rake overhangs and eave overhangs. And um, you want to control water because water going in the wrong place leads to termites and carpenter ants and paint peeling early and on and on and on and on. So I guess what I'm saying is really you kind of sort of do want gutters, even if it means you got to clean them out a lot. Um, and, you know, if you have a shed and you're okay with do-it-yourself projects, 
you can add your own gutters and it's not that hard to do. Um, you can get aluminum gutters, uh, you can get uh, PVC plastic gutters, um, you can get those at the, uh, again, local hardware store, big box stores, you can get that stuff. If you want to be real pretty, you can go for copper gutters, but that's going to be pricey. Um, so you got a lot of options there. And then, you know, again, you could have two rain barrels uh, connected by a hose, and then you only have to draw from one of the two. Um, so yeah, I think that's the way to go. Uh, I, I tried messing about, I don't have gutters on 100% of the barn and uh, where I don't have gutters, um, I have problems with water. And then the other thing is too, is when the water comes off the roof and hits the ground, you get splash back and up. And that water coming up can cause, uh, uh, there's the trim along the base of the house is called a water board. Uh, and water boards and corner boards are particularly particularly susceptible to rot. I'm sure you've seen it around West Newbury easily, all, or all around New England. Um, so once again, it's good to, to manage the water. Great. Anything else? Yes. How big yeah. of a, uh, let's see, does rain, does acid rain bother your systems over time? Uh, okay, so um, I have to be careful here because you probably heard of mansplaining and uh, professors have it worse. We have something called professor splaining where we jump to an answer without really knowing what we're talking about. So I'm very tempted to professor splain this and say, nah, it's no concern at all. But I don't really know. I don't think um, when we talk about acid rain, we're not talking about really acidic water. We're talking about water that's on the acidic side of neutral. Um, and I don't think it's going to be a problem in my system, but then my system is stainless steel and brass and plastic and copper. So I don't think it's a big issue. But I, yeah, I don't really know. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> Thank you. How big of a system would you recommend for modestly sized decorative gardens as opposed to vegetable gardens? Yeah. I mean, if you want to, if you want to get through, you know, we've had some spells, it's been like three, four weeks without rain. That's tough. So the more is the better. Um, and I don't, you know, anything will be helpful. I would say you'd want to start out with a minimum of two 50 gallon drums at, at, at the very minimum. And I would consider, you know, more. And you can tell that I'm the wrong person to ask this because I have yeah. three gigantic rain barrels. So yeah, more is better. But you, yeah. you, you know, like, okay, so that, that 500 gallon, 500 gallons, right? That's good for like 80% of the, the time for me. Um, and then having a thousand gallons is good for 95% of the time. Yeah. You have a lot to water. I do uh, have a lot to water, yeah. Yeah. Will PFAS leach out of plastic gutters? Oh, yeah, PFAS. Oh, my God. <laughs> Um, no. So uh, PFAS uh, is, it's not a real problem from normal plastic. PFAS is, is a big problem in products like uh, products that you use to waterproof fabrics. That's probably PFAS. Um, in the industrial side of things, Oh my God, they, they've been using it so much in so many different products and firefighting foam and Teflon and, and Gore-Tex. And it's just, it's just a horrible problem. It bothers the hell out of me. Uh, fortunately, people are becoming aware of it. What you might not be aware of is for us, um, 
you know, the, the, okay, so for human beings, you're most likely to get a harmful PFAS in your body. We all have it, by the way, Every, everybody's got, all the animals, all the critters, everybody's got PFAS. Um, the, the harmful level in us humans is probably gonna come from drinking water where it hasn't been treated. Mm -hmm. Now, to the best of my knowledge, that's not a big problem for our water supply or our well water supply. And places like New Hampshire, though, uh, certain industries have been using it and polluting, and it's just a gigantic problem. Um, the only way to remove it from your drinking water system that's reliable that I know of is to install a reverse osmosis system. Um, mm -hmm. And then you have to be sure that you change the filters per the manufacturer's recommendation. You're probably changing most of the filters once a year. And then there's a reverse osmosis filter that you have to replace every three or five years. Um, but as far as water coming off the roof and going through a system like this, as far as PFAS coming from most plastics, that's not, that's not, not an issue. That's good um, and, and then the, the other place that you're likely to get PFAS and ingest it is when you've got paper products that have been treated with PFAS so that things don't get greasy. So uh, the cardboard that might be uh, in a processed food, um, uh, microwave popcorn, and yeah, obviously that's a whole nother lecture. And uh, yeah, I, I get very upset about PFAS. <laughs> Well, Ray, this was your first lecture on this whole water system, which has yeah. been wonderful. And we've already had a request that your next lecture for all of this included in-person practicum. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm just gonna, good. well, you know, I will be retiring before too long and maybe I'll just, I'll just wander around like Johnny Appleseed and help people <laughs> install rain barrels. Maybe that's. That, that would You'll definitely be... help West Newberry now. There you go. See, you'll be re-inspiring. So oh, okay. You'll never well, retire. There you go. Yeah. yeah. As long Maybe. as people leave me a little plot where I can grow, uh, you know, some some gourds and some golden retrievers. <laughs> Ray, when I was reading up on what uh, rain got us and and collecting water, there was a lot of information about not to do it on asphalt roofs. What's your feeling on that? So are you talking about like like regular shingles, asphalt shingles? That yeah, kind of yeah, and or well, specifically not to use the water to water edible plants. Well, that's interesting. Um, I don't know of that being a problem, um, but it could be, and I'm just not aware of it. I will say that um, you know, when it comes to harmful chemicals leaching out of man-made materials or any material for that matter, um, there's a curve. And when the material when the material's brand new, um, you're going to get a bigger problem than when the material's weathered. Um, and um, the only other thing that that's sort of related to that that I do know about is that the the type of uh, blacktop resurfacing uh compounds that you can get for driveways and whatnot those are pretty nasty it's probably better just to let your asphalt driveway turn a light gray and have cracks in it um but i don't i don't know about problems and then uh, you know there are all different types of vegetables and fruits have different amount of take up um so there's there's you know, it's a, you know, whether or not it's worth purchasing organic vegetables and fruits and whatnot depends on the thing that you're buying. Um, and, I, and the same thing is true in gardens as well. But I'll have to look into that. Like I said, this is the first time I've taught this. And uh, yeah, <clears throat> always something new to learn. Yeah. Another question I had was you were talking about underground systems that require a pump. Um, if you are on a well, are you just using a lot less electricity to pump from a system than you would a well? Well, yes. So the, uh, the amount of electricity you need to use to move water depends on uh, the pressure and the flow. Um, 
And uh, so uh, when you're pumping out of a well, you have to bring that water up uh, a significant vertical height. If you're pumping water out of a rain barrel, you're just uh, moving it mostly horizontally. Um, but yeah, I mean, you can see I've got solar panels up. Uh, electrical usage is, an, is another concern, which is another reason why you want your pumps to turn off automatically. Um, yeah, when I bought this house, they had a sump pump in and the sump pump discharged basically out a basement window about three feet away. And that water then soaked into the ground and came back into the sump pump. So in the wet season, the house that I bought was just spending a lot of electricity to pump water in a circle. <laughs> yeah, that's fixed now. By the way, if you can collect your sump pump water since you're paying to pump it anyway, that's, oh, that's interesting. That would work. And uh, that's been, I, I haven't figured out a way for, I haven't figured out a way for me to do it yet, but oh, that's, that's one of the things that's where I'll wake, up at, I'll wake up at three in the morning and then I'll, I won't be able to get back to sleep because I'm thinking about pipes running through the basement and all that kind of stuff. But <laughs> yeah, generally that water coming up from a sump pump, generally speaking, that water is excellent water. You would have to be concerned about, you know, how far it, you know, whether or not you're getting water from the septic field. But if your septic field is working properly, as long as you're X number of feet away, it's not going to be a problem. It's coming up from the corner. Get your, get your septic tank pumped. But Don't let that go. Every two years, be on the safe side, which is probably too often budget-wise, but it's not too often septic tank-wise. Don't let those septic tanks go. My God, it's expensive to fix that system. Yeah. I might be deviating now, but I'm kind of, since I'm speaking with the professor, I figure you might like to go on tangents. Um, so I was having a conversation with Paul Savigny about gray water systems. Oh, and, yeah. And he said something about like the new Massachusetts Title V regulations don't allow it. It's like. So gray water <laughs> systems are fantastic. So uh, for for those who don't know what we're talking about. The water coming out of your kitchen sink from doing the dishes and the water coming out of, out of the sink in your bathroom, uh, the water coming out of your clothes washer and your dishwasher, all that water, though it has soap in it and though it has whatever it was you were washing off, if used responsibly, uh, you know, you're not washing, I don't know, you're not dumping a bunch of bleach down your kitchen sink or or you know, washing off automobile parts in your kit. Use the way most people use that. You create this soapy water with organics. It's called gray water. And then black water is what, what's coming out of your toilet. Um, so it's not easy to do because your, sis, your house plumbing system has to, be, has to have these two different paths. And then the gray water, despite the fact that it's full of soap, that'll work just fine on the gardens and won't hurt them a bit. So it's a great technique. However, it scares the hell out of officials all over the United States. Um, they're using it in Europe and it's more accepted in Canada, but it scares the hell out of people in the United States. And so in most places, it's actually not legal. Um, I suppose you could, you, you know, if, if you really wanted one, you could fight for it. And Paul is a fantastic guy. And I'm sure he would listen respectfully. And if he could find a way to let you do it, by God, I'm sure he'd work with you on doing it. Um, but yeah, it's, if you, were doing, if you were doing brand new construction, if you were building something from scratch, it wouldn't be that bad. Or if you weren't trying to get the whole house, you were trying to get the kitchen sink and the dishwasher and maybe your laundry machine, you could probably replumb those few places and, and have a good gray water to use at not too much extra money. But uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's not common. It scares the hell out of people. So it's usually not legal. But it makes your septic system last much longer. Mm -hmm. I, I love gray water system. There's also something out there uh, called toilet to tap, 
where, uh, where uh, all your sewage water is treated to a point where it can be put back in the drinking water system. That's another subject that's fun to talk about. Uh, <laughs> oh, I love it. Yeah. Oh. Nancy, any other questions? I don't see any questions in the yeah. chat except um, agreement about the sump pump and uh, yeah. You know, the pain of hearing the sump pump and the waste and water. <laughs> yeah. And Ray, yeah. there's lots of thank yous to you for this oh, informative, good. really informative. So thank you so much for putting this together for us. We really appreciate your work and all of your insight into this uh, topic. It's well, been fun. I don't, I, it was fun putting it together. And like I said, I don't claim to be uh, any smarter about this than anybody in the audience. Uh, you know, I'm learning as I go. You on. are. No, no, no. Uh, wow. But uh, yeah, it's like gardening itself. You know, you try a bunch of stuff and a lot of it doesn't work. And so you tear that out and try something else. There you go. I, I, I planted, I recently planted an ideal plant in my backyard and it's, it's a natural plant and it doesn't, you know, it, it's, uh, it's good for uh, pollinators and, uh, you know, oh. It's not poisonous to the dog and all that kind of stuff. I don't even remember the name of it, but it's very urine intolerant. And I planted it in a place where Tucker just loves to pee. And so <laughs> you, know, you try these things and some work and some don't. And that's what, it's just not working. Well, when you come to the native plant sale, there you go. Uh, for the garden club, you're going to have to tell us the name of this amazing native plant. So yeah, that'll be really fun. No, it's it, it would be amazing if it if it was better. Now there's you're talking about acid rain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd like it. Oh, one little one little story. Uh, uh, anybody can sign off they want. There's a little story when it comes to dog urine. They came out years ago. They came out with steel called weathering steel, and the idea is that the rust wouldn't slough off and it would protect the steel from rust. They use it all over the place, highway bridges all over the place. And they used it uh, for street light poles down in, uh, I think it might've been Houston, Texas. And after that whole system was up, uh, one of these street lights fell over and, and damn near killed a woman. And uh, it, it found, and they found out, they, they you know, figured out what was going on. And the yeah. weathering steel works great, but not to dog urine. Wow. All these dogs were peeing on these light poles, and it just rusted out the base of the light pole. Oh, gee. So now there are engineering documents on how to use weathering steel to avoid the problems with dog urine. <laughs> there you go. That's a great one. I got a million stories. We're just gonna, we're just gonna the next seminar is just gonna be Uncle Ray stories. And I'm, so that would be fun. Yeah. Sounds wonderful. All right. Thank you, everyone, for Thank participating. You. It's Thank been a you, fun evening. Thank, Thank you, Nancy. Thank you yeah, so much, we'll, Ray. We'll have this video up probably in a week, and we'll share it with Corinne, who will send it out to everyone that registered. Great. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.